August 3rd, 1914, the major powers launched the war nobody wanted. It was to be the most devastating of all time. In the first month, the great armies clashed in a series of murderous battles, finally ending in a stalemate stretching from Switzerland to the North Sea. It was during these early weeks that the airplane came into its own. Since the Wright brothers' historic flight in 1903, the plane had seemed but a toy for the rich and eccentric. The military soon discovered that these early planes, though flimsy, could play an essential role through aerial observation and photography. skies became crowded with planes from both sides, a few of the more imaginative pilots tried to demolish their foes with pistols, hand grenades, and even bricks. Soon the rapidly improving planes were equipped with machine guns and piloted by men who were quickly learning the tactics of aerial warfare. These men fought alone, guided by the codes of an earlier age. They were the knights of the sky. Below, in the mud of the trenches, surrounded by death on a mass scale, Millions watched with fascination the battle of the skies. Among them were a group of Americans. Although America was not at war, these men had rallied to the colors of France. Motivated only by their faith and deep-rooted idealism, some had joined the American Field Service or the Red Cross. Others joined the Foreign Legion, which required no national oath of allegiance. Looking skyward, this small band of Americans saw a way to escape the prison of the trenches and grasp a thread of private glory. Finally, in April 1960, after a year of frustrating attempts, the Escadrille Americaine was formed with a total of seven pilots. Later, after an official protest by the German ambassador in Washington, the French changed the name to the Lafayette Escadrille. The group began training in northeastern France. Although they all had a common purpose, their backgrounds were diverse and unusual. Included among this group were Bill Thaw, who had attended Yale, and Norman Prince, a friend from Harvard. It was Prince who had conceived the idea of an American squadron, and with Thaw's help, was responsible for the creation of the Escadrille. Kiffin Rockwell, fresh from the Foreign Legion, was a Southerner and a fighter. He would be the first to score a victory. James McConnell came over from the ambulance service, where he'd been a driver at the front. Victor Chapman, a member of an old New York family, was carefree and reckless. He would be the first to die. Under the guidance of the French instructors, the men studied the principles of aviation, learned how to handle machine guns, and through trial and error, they began to master the Newport. Their first missions were exhilarating, but for the inexperienced Americans, filled with hazards. Once in the air, they soon forgot the principles of formation flying and went charging off after the enemy. Several crash landings and angry tun lashings from their furious superiors finally helped to weld the Lafayette Escadrille into a fighting unit. Although there were other Americans flying with the French and British squadrons, it was this handful of men who captured the attention of the world and their fellow countrymen a year before America was to join the war. To a world exhausted by a seemingly endless war, these men appeared carefree and lighthearted. With their lion mascots, whiskey and soda, they seemed to epitomize America and her people. Bursting with life, humor, and practical jokes, they brought fresh blood to a battle-scarred Europe. These young men could still laugh at themselves and at the world. The flyers were able to spend pleasant days behind the lines, where life could still be filled with good times. But they were still willing to sacrifice everything for a cause they thought was right. For the realities of war were just as grim for them as for all pilots. 
The life expectancy of a combat flyer was only three weeks. As the fame of the Escadrille spread, other Americans joined the ranks. Among them was Raoul Lufberry, who became America's first ace. Essentially a loner and a world adventurer, he had a romantic image of life. Buffberry was a professional who methodically mastered the arts of aerial combat. You had to be a professional to survive in the skies against men like Baron Manfred von Richthofen, who led his famous flying circus in a constant search for the enemy. After 80 victories, however, Richthofen, like most of the great aces, met his death in a fiery plunge. It was the dogfight which captured the imagination of America. The lonely pilot in his flimsy machine, diving, swooping, lunging among the murderous enemy fire for all the world to see. Events moved swiftly. Finally, inevitably, America entered the war in 1917. The men of the Lafayette Escadrille were no longer alone. Newspaper and magazine stories of their heroism and exploits had helped America focus on why they were there. Now they would be followed by millions of others willing to join together for a common cause. These lone pioneers had become national heroes. To help the United States create an Air Force, some members of the Escadrille returned home to serve as instructors. majority, however, continued to serve in France until early in 1917 when they were absorbed into rapidly forming American squadrons. New names soon joined the roster of American aces. Perhaps the most famous was a former racing car driver, Eddie Rickenbacker, who under the guidance of Raoul Lufberry soon became the leading ace with 27 victories and the commander of the famed 94th Squadron. He knew the days of the lone pilot were numbered and he worked effectively to develop squadron teamwork. Toward the end of the war, Bill Thaw was decorated for his contribution as an airman and as one of the organizers of the Lafayette Escadrille but there was one ace who could not be decorated. Raoul Lufberry had been waiting impatiently to revenge a fallen comrade. One spring morning, he saw his chance and went off alone after a German plane. Then suddenly, his plane burst into flames. Lufberry leaped to his death. He was given an airman's funeral. days of Lufberry, McConnell, Rockwell, Chapman, and Prince were gone forever. Now there were hundreds of planes flying in formation. This was the beginning of an era of close cooperation, not only in the air, but between all the services. The lone pioneers of the Escadrille had blazed a trail which would be followed by future generations serving in their nation's defense. Barry's death had marked the end of a crusade and the beginning of the legend of the young men of the Lafayette Escadrille who had given themselves to a noble cause high over the fields of Flanders and France. Mm -hmm.